Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is a solo Q&A live stream, so it's just me. Uh, I'm taking any questions that you've got for me. The questions I've got on Patreon are mostly around A Song of Ice and Fire, so I suspect we'll spend most of our time uh, thinking about that. Then at the end, I've got a couple of questions on Westworld, so if you're into Westworld, then uh, there'll be a few questions for you there at the end. My main Westworld Q&A sessions are on Sundays, for those who are into it. It's a fantastic start so far to the season. Um, I've been focusing a lot on that week, on on that this week. Uh, but uh, yeah, main Westworld Q and A session on Sunday. But uh, hi, welcome. Particular welcome if this is your first time uh, tuning in live to this. Um, I see a couple of new faces in the chat, and I also want to say, uh, Chris of Oldstones, uh, moderator supreme. I believe it was your name day recently, so happy name day! Thank you so much for all you do, not just for for me uh, being uh, one of my excellent moderators, but also uh, across the the wider community of uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Thank you, I really do appreciate that. I hope you had a fantastic day. Uh, so let's uh, get into this. Um, we have, uh, as always, I have a number of questions from my uh, patrons that uh, I'm going to sort of shape this around, but I'm going to try and dip into the chat as much as possible to try and uh, see where, where where the questions are. Uh, so uh, let's start off with uh, Maura Lee. Hi there, Maura, saying, uh, Robert, you mentioned during a previous live stream how the Horn of Winter will awaken stone giants in the crypts. Will that also include the stone direwolves that are also in the crypts? Um, so this is a question uh, based on, I mean, I've talked about it in a few recent live streams, but also I've done a couple of recent videos on this. Uh, the idea that the reason why all of the Stark Dead are down there in Winterfell crypts is that they can be awoken and they can uh, rise to uh, aid in the defense of Winterfell when the others come. Now, uh, for a while, I thought perhaps that was just the spirits of the dead Starks. But then, um, actually, in prompting from a question from one of my patrons, I started looking at the idea that it might actually be the statues themselves that come alive. And it turns out there's huge amounts of kind of what we might call foreshadowing or sort of other examples of this within A Song of Ice and Fire of statues coming to life. Now, uh, if we accept that the statues of the kings of winter come to life. What about the stone direwolves that we're told are, are lying uh, at their feet for every uh, king of winter? Um, I think the short answer is we don't know whether they're included in this. The, the, the main uh, thrust of the suggestion that the, the statues will come alive comes from the fact that the statues, whenever they're de described in any way, they're described as being lifelike. We, we hear about them uh, watching what's going on, listening uh, about them, uh, tracking people's movements, about them sort of looming over and, and, and glaring at people and all the rest of it. So that is where that comes from. The direwolves, we don't get so much of that. Uh, we do have a couple of passing references to uh, them uh, appearing to come alive, their shadows moving about on the walls and things like that. So there is a hint of it. Uh, and I like the idea that the stone direwolves are there for a reason. Um, but we we don't know is the short answer. I uh, Personally, I like it. But again, we don't. This is something that I will only ever go as far as the evidence will suggest. We do not have the evidence to say that they definitely will. Um, uh, Alex Ricketts saying, seems a bit like the alternative Garin's curse, woman coming out of the mist and kissing a statue, bring it to life. Yeah, so Garin's curse, for those who don't know, this is picking up on this, the statue's idea. Uh, it, this was uh, over um, uh, where the stone men come from, if you remember, it was, it was in the show, but also um, in the books. Tyrion goes through there on the Shy Maid and the stone men um, uh, come out to try and uh, attack him, drag him under the water and all the rest of it. Uh, and this curse of grayscale, which is what makes you a stone person, is this kind of underlying threat throughout the, uh, the series. Um, 
John Connington, who's quite a major character in the books, <clears throat> he, he, pardon me, he has this, um, uh, and he's not really let on about it. So it's it's sort of like keeping on going uh, throughout uh, throughout there, and he's going to bring this almost certainly into King's Landing. So that's the uh, th that's where that's coming from now, and it's called Garin's Curse because Prince Garin was the person who he called down the curse initially, which is what led to all of this. Now, um, when you say it's a curse in reverse, now the the interesting thing about that is that the legend of the leader of the Stone Men is a person called the Shrouded Lord. And we hear about the legend of how the Shrouded Lord was created was by being a statue kissed and brought to life. So that, as a statue, so that is one of the many examples we have across the world of ice and fire in these books of statues coming to life. Uh, sometimes they're sort of legends like that, sometimes they're stories, uh, sometimes they're more figurative, Lady Stoneheart, for example. Um, uh, th these, these things, images happen all over the place and they're clearly building to something and if you think about what collection of statues do we have and that is Winterfell so uh, or possibly Dragonstone is the other the option that the links there are quite strong but yeah when you say Garen's curse uh, in reverse in yes but also there is a direct link going on across there as well um, <laughs> glasses count as how many times our dear Robert takes them off Add another one. Um, so I hope more of that uh, sort of uh, clarifies the situation with the, the statues. There is a lot of symbolism about the, 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 the statues of the Kings of Winter coming to life. Less so about the diabolos, but they are sometimes kind of hinted at. Um, let's go to uh, another question. And so this will will move around. Uh, Joe Magician, please stop counting. Uh, we'll move around quite a lot in, in this live stream, uh, various topics. So uh, this is one of those ones where we're going to sort of dot around quite a bit. Uh, Teme Ritian uh, saying, uh, apologies if I mispronounce that, what do you make of the two very cryptic letters that John received from Cotter Pike? during the expedition to Hardhome. This is a this is very much a book question. They always seemed very strange to me. They should be war reports, concise and to the point, but are in fact messy and vague, uh, with apparent errors going from 20 to eight ravens with only two letters sent, going from 11 ships to six ships with only three lost ships. Um, is there some kind of hidden message there? Um, I think the... The short answer I have to this is that I don't think there is a hidden message. So Cotter Pike, for those who don't know, um, if, you, if you're a show-only person, you, you remember when John went to Hardhome to try and rescue uh, the people at Hardhome. John uh, sends in the books, he sends Cotter Pike, who's this guy over at Eastwatch. Uh, he sends him with some boats and some people up to go to uh, Hardhome um, rather than him personally. He's, planning on going himself, but he doesn't quite make it. So this sort of expedition of boats goes up. And then we haven't got a POV chapter from them. So all we get are these two very short messages sent back via Raven. There's a maester there uh, who sends the, the Ravens. And the messages are very short and punchy. They're not long, erudite kind of uh, messages, as you would expect something that could be tied around uh, a raven's leg. And I, they are typically sentences like three or four words, like left with 11 ships. Uh, there are dead in the water, uh, dead things in the water, that, that, full stop. That's, that's what it is. There's no explanation. It's just short, punchy points, bang, 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 bang. Um, I think this actually is George R. R. Martin doing a, a very good job of showing that this is a different writing style. This is somebody who um, probably is not particularly lettered, Cotter Pike. Uh, he's not a lord or anything like that. Um, and he is dictating something.
something for somebody else to write is is written by somebody else and so he just says this then this then this then this and that's the style it comes across now uh, across as so that is uh, the sort of the background to it as for the individual things the yes there are some discrepancies between the first letter and the second letter the first is talking about um uh, 11 ships going the second is talking about six ships have arrived uh, and then it describes three ships that have been lost in various ways um uh, it talks about taking 20 ravens with them and then late in the second letter it says we now have eight ravens um the i think the answer to this the the straightforward answer is that there is a missing letter there is a letter somewhere in the middle that we haven't got. Typically, they wouldn't just send one raven and, and put everything on that. They might send two ravens if it's a particularly hazardous journey or whatever, or three ravens. So um, that is what is going on. I think if there were, like, we have lost lots of ravens, that would have been included in the message. So I think basically all that's happened is that uh, there is a missing letter. John does not get, he doesn't, think about this at all now john isn't uh, try not to be too cruel about john but he's not always the smartest person he doesn't always read between the lines of what's going on but um he doesn't even seem slightly perturbed by this fact that that he says there are 11 now there's six okay fair enough um so i don't i don't think we should read too much into it you suggest perhaps this is something to do with davos using ships um i don't think so davos um timelines are never 100 percent clear here but davos is down in white harbor to start with uh, and then looking to go up to skagos i don't think he's there at the right time to be involved in this at all so uh, i like the thinking but i don't think that that's actually what's going on here um san rixian hi there san rixian uh for those who don't know san rixian san rixian is one of the many amazing artists we have in this community do i'm sure one of the if you're watching live one of the uh, moderators will put a link to uh, her website down there uh, please do go in and check this out uh, check out uh, she does t-shirts and various other things uh highly recommended anyway uh who is your favorite dane oh <sighs> Shara, I think it has to be. The problem with the Danes is that you don't get you don't get to know many of them because uh, there are some historical Danes. Um, uh, the Danes uh, sort of slightly disappear from the action. Ned Dane, I don't know. He's not. I, I never get that excited by Ned Dane. Arthur Dane comes across as this great hero, but really, I I don't think he was. He was a great fighter, but I I. I personally include him within that king's guard who stood there and watched uh, a king do horrendous things and did nothing uh, so i don't personally rate him particularly highly ashara dane i think is a magnificent creation who um somehow despite only being mentioned 11 12 times in the entire series um uh, is the subject of so much speculation and i think that is an astonishing thing that you can create a character that is just so in many ways peripheral to the action and yet everybody fixates on them that for me shows a wonderful character um so yeah i think i'll go with uh with ashara on that one um let's uh have a quick flick through the um uh, the chat just to see um there's any more questions? Um, uh, da, 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 people saying Ned Dane. Um, uh, yeah, I don't mean Ned Dane. Ned, Ned Dane. So Ned Dane is the the time of the books. He is the new um, Lord of Winterfell, effectively, uh, and he's very young um, and uh, joins the Brotherhood without banners. I I think the thing about Ned Dane is that he. George R. R. Martin had plans for him when, for those who do not know, he had this idea that he was perhaps going to have a five-year gap between books to allow some of his younger characters to grow up a little bit, allow the dragons to grow up a little bit. Uh, Ned Dane almost certainly was one of those characters who's going to be allowed to grow up a little bit and have a bigger role in the future. 
Uh, but then George R. R. Martin decided against the five-year jump, and so Ned Bain didn't grow up a bit, and I suspect that a lot of his storyline has been taken up by Gerald Dane, who we meet later on in the books, um, Dark Star. So, um, uh, yes, Ned Dane is a fun character, but I, I'm not... He feels slightly unfinished to me. Um, uh, Joe Magician saying, I consider John to be distracted, usually by his personal angst. Yes, I mean, he, he has a lot of... Um, Brooding to do, as John it has to be said. Uh, Hacks Dogma, hi Hacks, uh, good to see you in the chat as well. Uh, Hacks Dogma, for those who don't know, is uh, um, an excellent YouTuber, fantastic channel, particularly if you're into Westworld. Uh, I'm collaborating with him. He's a regular guest on my uh, Sunday pre show, Westworld pre shows, uh, and he does uh, fantastic videos breaking down the episodes and coming up with some really interesting theories in between episodes as well. So please do go and check him out. Okay, let's uh, nip back to questions from my patrons. Um, Anime Lover Nicole says, uh, do you think Aya will kill Lady Stoneheart? Uh, with mercy written into, into her character and everything. Um, and speaking of Aya, how do you think she will come back to Westeros? I saw an LML uh, Quinn's Ideas video about Bravos and I wanted to know your thoughts. I've not seen that video. I'm aware that they're doing a whole series of videos. Uh, about the winds of winter, I've not watched any of them. I have to say, been rather busy this week. Um, in terms of how I is going to get back to Westeros, she is. Uh, it's going to be broadly, not exactly, but broadly, what happened in the show. As in, what we've already seen in the books is that she, yes, she's getting bought into this faceless men thing, but she cannot let go of her Stark heritage, no matter what. The, the pre-release chapter from the, from the Winds of Winter that we saw, um, she, uh, she's she got the name Mercy, but she sees someone, a short version of the chapter, um, which I've, if you're interested, I've narrated, audio narrated, all of the pre-release chapters from the Winds of Winter. They're available over on my Patreon page, if you're interested in that, link down in the description. But she... Um, spots somebody who is on her list, her kill list, and then she immediately abandons her mission her, or, or, or everything that the Faceless Men have said that she's going to do to kill him. That's w where her mindset is, is that, the yes, she might be pretending to be a Faceless Man, but she will not let go of her Stark heritage and her Stark grudges. So that's going to be roughly the same um, as happened uh, on the show in as much as she will get to the point where she can no longer reconcile these two or, or the faceless men recognize that she can no longer um, rationalize these two parts of her and she will have to go. So she'll head back over to Westeros. Um, and uh, in terms of the first part that you've got there and with her kill list still live, in terms of the first part, you're saying that Mercy is now a part of a character. Now, that, I think, comes from, well, there's a couple of things here. Firstly, that uh, she is given the name Mercy, which I think is, I think you're right. I think that that will translate into her character a little bit. But also, secondly, uh, one of the most interesting uh, conversations that she has with the faceless men, with the kindly man, who's her main contact for a little of this time, is when he talks about assassinations of people and she basically says, well, did they deserve it? And he says, it's not about whether they deserved it. All men must die. And she she just like, well, no, you, you only kill people if they deserve to die. You don't just kill people randomly. And this is in a way mercy because she's heading towards this idea that whether people deserve stuff or not, is an issue now. Uh, so she's just not not just randomly killing people. She's deciding whether somebody is worthy of death. The next step on from that is the mercy uh, part of her kind of character development. I would personally argue, where she decides that some people do deserve death, but she has mercy on them anyway. She decides actually, yes, they should die. I want them dead, but. I'm going to have mercy. So I think that is a long-term character arc for her. 
Again, we saw it in very vague, rough terms on the show when she effectively gave up her kill list right at the very end. I think that something along those lines will happen is that she will get to the point where she decides actually she's not going to kill all the people on her list. As for uh, killing Lady Stoneheart, um, I think that's a fascinating idea because I don't think this is, I mean, you could argue this is a mercy because Lady Stoneheart was her mother, but now it's just like a shadow of who her mother was. So it would be a mercy to kill her. I don't think that is how Arya would think. I don't think she would say, well, this person used to be my mother and now I'm going to kill her. That's a mercy. That That doesn't kind of strike me. I think that... Lady Stoneheart is most likely to die because she gives up her hold on life, because she is only there because she is keeping tight inside her this anger and hatred and need for vengeance. And when she realises that that need for vengeance is gone because the people who have wronged her family are gone and actually a lot of the people who she thought had been killed like Bran and Rickon aren't dead. When that happens, that is when she can let go. So I think that's my my take on what's going on with Lady Stoneheart. So I don't think um, that uh, Arya will kill her. Um, okay, let's go with uh, another question from... Um, Oh, actually, Nic Nicola Jurikin is saying, why doesn't Ned see the King's Guard in his dreams? Well, he does see, so he has a fever dream about the Tower of Joy and he sees them as kind of phantasms. This is, um, this is simply poetic language. Uh, and it's also, there's, I mean, there are other people who do better videos on this kind of stuff than me, but there's a lot of kind of imagery there of, of, of light and dark going on between the King's Guard and um, uh, Ned's. Uh, Ned's allies, but he doesn't see them because this is a fever dream, and that's that's all it is. It's not him having a firm memory of what is going on. Um, uh, Teme Rotiom says, "Who do you think the harpy is? Does it matter much? Will Danny confront her when she comes back, or will Tyrion unmask her?" I have read an interesting theory that it might be Zarina, the slave trader. Okay, so this is, we're taking taking ourselves all the way over to Maureen for this one. So uh, Maureen, uh, Danny has come in and she has all her crazy foreign ways of like getting rid of slavery and things like that, stopping the fighting pits. Uh, and the locals are against it. Well, the, the local um, aristocracy are against it. And the resistance... Uh, are known as the, the harpies. So, um, the the leader being the harpy. Um, uh, so the question is, who is the leader of this resistance? Effectively, now, um, I think the first question when you're saying, does it matter much? I think I would agree. I don't think it does matter much. Uh, the important point is that there is opposition to her. She is trying to do things, she is trying to impose her will on this city, and there is opposition to it. And that is the, the important the takeaway point we've got here. Uh, as for who actually it might be, uh, will we find out? Quite possibly. Um, Zarina, the slave trader, is a character we only meet, I think, I think she's mentioned three or four times. She's there uh, outside, I think it's outside the city walls, um, bidding for slaves uh, to go into the fighting pits. Um, now, she has this really annoying habit that everyone finds it annoying when she bids uh, and somebody bids something and she just puts up a hand and says, and won. Um, and everyone just hates what she does, uh, which is an interesting kind of counter flaw, but it kind of makes us pay attention to her. She tries to bid for, I think, for Tyrion and Jorah uh, and fails. She also seems to have some kind of an interest in the pub that the the Windblown, who are this sellsword company, uh, meet at. Um, they have been hired by the Junkish, who uh, 
then um, siege effectively, besiege the city of Marine. Uh, they are wanting to bring back slavery. So she seems to have the right kind of connections. She's pro fighting pits, she's pro slavery, she seems to have links to the Junkish and all the rest of it. So I, I kind of understand where the idea comes from. Um, I don't think she is. I think that it's much more likely that the leader of this is somebody who is clearly influential within Marine, whereas she doesn't appear to be particularly influential within Marine. She seems to have more influence as sort of a, a ground level and with the slave trade more widely in, in Slaver's Bay. Um, now, um, who does that leave? Well, I think the obvious answer is Hisdar. Um, uh, who s seems to be trying to take over control in Danny's absence. He's he's a figurehead, um, and he seems to be happily surviving the attacks. People don't seem to be uh, killing him. So, yes, that's a clear possibility. But I think fundamentally we, we don't know. They may find out. Um, depends. I mean, it really depends on how much detail... George R. R. Martin goes in in the next book. If 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 he kind of skates over the marine bit, where Danny arrives back, and then she immediately, you know, she meets all the people she has to meet. There's a long list of people she has to meet in marine, and then she immediately gets on boats and heads off. Um, then I don't think we will. If if we take a lot longer, then it's entirely possible that yes, we will discover who they are. I think that. There's a possibility that after she's gone, at some point much later, we just hear the rumours say, and the Harpies took control of Marine once more. And it's almost as if Danny's then arrived at Westeros and she goes, well, OK, that's it. I tried, but now I'm just about the invasion of Westeros. That's all I am. Uh, so I th that, that may well be the way it goes. I don't fundamentally think it matters who it is so much as the the principle that the the established aristocracy in marine want her out um liam mullen thank you so much for the super chat uh, this is a uh, picking up on a question from somebody else i love it when people do this uh, with super chats um uh, saying uh, from jeff green what do you think will happen with stoneheart brienne and jamie in the cave Okay, so um, I am going to do at some point soon a video on what's going on with uh, with these characters because I, I, I do get asked this a lot and it's something that I've not done a full study on. But the short answer is what seems to have been going on is that um, uh, Lady Stoneheart captured Brienne. Uh, she was starting to hang her and then Brienne in order to save Pod. Um, Brienne agrees to fight for or, or do Lady Stoneheart's bidding, which seems to be to take her to Jamie to bring him back to Lady Stoneheart. Jamie obviously is uh, a Lannister, um, and so she will hold him responsible for um, a huge amount of what's gone wrong with uh, the family. I think that Jamie will survive. I don't know whether he will. Uh, managed to talk his way out of it. But uh, what I hope will happen is that uh, between them, they will be able to persuade Lady Stoneheart that actually what they've done is everything in their power to do what they said they were going to do. Because if you remember all the way back books earlier, then uh, Brienne went off with Jamie. Uh, on the proviso that from Catelyn Stark, on the proviso that he was going to go there and effectively negotiate the, the release and safe departure of Sansa uh, and Arya if they could find her. So that was what was going to go on. Now, Jamie then uh, has handed this over to Brienne to go off and try and look uh, for them, and Brienne spent pretty much an entire book wandering around the Riverlands trying to find uh, them. I think uh, perhaps 
what happens is that he from there then heads back down to king's landing that i i think is the only uh in order to try and get this back on track with the broad uh um storyline that we saw on the book and then on the show i think he then has to commit to her giving his word that he will then go and try and um find where Sansa is because that's the next stage nobody knows where Arya is but to try and find where Sansa is so I think that's what's going to happen is that he's going to come back to Lainey Stoneheart with Brienne then he's going to from there he will head down to King's Landing that for me it's the most likely as I said I'm going to do a full study of this so it's entirely possible that I will uncover some stuff that I haven't spotted on just my early reading through um uh, but uh, that's my my first take is that he would then go down renewing his promise to be looking after the the stark children um tubbs says if lady stoneheart doesn't hang jamie i'm burning all my game of thrones books well not really but i'll pretend i did uh yeah i mean she will be angry with him and i think that she needs to um uh she needs to work out what is it that she's actually and actively doing jamie is not personally responsible for the deaths of any of her children and he has actively gone out to try and protect them so it's really a matter of how much of catelyn's pragmatism remains within lady stoneheart that i think is the key thing uh maura lee i see you're in the chat uh maura uh, thank you so much you did a, a super chat i think it was super chat and a couple of super stickers beforehand uh so just thank you so much saying thoroughly enjoying listening to alice's adventures in wonderland on the well-told tale just a show of immense love and appreciation for all the fabulous content and stories on both channels so thank you very much more hugely appreciate um uh, all of your support so uh thank you very much for that i'll talk about the well-told tale um in a little bit but yes i'm currently reading my way through uh Alice in Wonderland, uh, basically, which is obviously a fantastic story. So if you're interested in that, please do go and check out uh, The Well Told Tale, which is my audio narration um, channel. Um, Stephanie Frederick says, I've been thinking about the Tower of Joy. I think there must have been dozens of people there. Well, maybe not dozens, but more than a few. I just doubt Leanna was doing the cooking, for instance. What happened to all of them? Would they have all kept quiet? Maybe if it meant your life. Um, what about Howland? He can make castles appear and disappear. Could it be magic? So the, the question is what, um, how many people were there um, on the, uh, at the Tower of Joy and what happened to them? Um, so I agree, there must have been other people. So I've done a few videos on the Tower of Joy. I've got a playlist, actually, there's a playlist link down in the description if you're interested in this. Um, but the, the short answer is yes. Even, even if you go as minimal as you possibly can, I think it's extremely likely that there is at least a maester or, or a midwife or someone there to help with the birth. Um, a maester probably as well to be sort of helping sending messages to and fro they want to be wanted to be cut off all that time perhaps some squires i think it's highly likely that liana would have had some sort of company there for most of the time she was there so yes almost certainly there will have been people and they were in uh, let's not forget a tower this wasn't a massive castle but a tower somewhere in the middle of the mountains that will have need to be been provisioned, so that you'll have need to have people coming in with stuff all the time. So yes, I think it's entirely likely that there were other people there. And while we're at it, let, let's just knock on the head this idea, the Tower of Joy was this huge secret where, where it was. People will have known about this. Um, the moment you start, yes, Robert Baratheon didn't know where it was, Ned found it relatively easily. Gerald Hightower seems to have gone straight there when told to go and get Rhaegar, so they must have known where it was relatively easily. This was on the Prince's Pass, which was like effectively the main highway between Dawn and, and the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. Um, House Fowler guard that. They would have known if there were 
three members of the king's guard and the uh, the king in king in waiting uh, in in a, one of their watchtowers. They will have known that. They will have told the Martells. This is not going to be a secret. So yes, there will have been um, a few dozen, maybe even hundreds of people who knew that they were there. All that mattered was that it it was kept as a secret. It was kept from Robert Baratheon. That was the only thing that really mattered. So yes, there were lots of people. My best guess, I talked about this with uh, Joe Magician when he was on a few weeks ago. I can't remember when. Um, the 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 most likely solution to this is that House Dane, which is relatively close by, um, were the people doing the provisioning. They would have been the people they the, the people who could be trusted, and so they brought in any food and you know, uh, towels and hot water or whatever they needed in those days to help with childbirth um, and maester and all the rest of it. So that will have been where everybody comes from. What happened to all of those people? Um, well, we're not told. George R. R. Martin, as always, has very precise language about uh, things around the Tower of Joy. And we're told about the fight and of those people who were involved in the fight who rode away. And that's it. We're not told about anything else. I think it's entirely likely that there were other people from House Dane who were there who helped show them the way to Starfall afterwards. They will have kept quiet because they will have been ordered to keep quiet. The reason they'll have been ordered to keep quiet is because uh, this is, yes, this is on pain of death, effectively. Robert Baratheon was killing any Targaryens that he could get his hands on. And when you start looking at the list of the the people who were allies with Rhaegar, it's not just um not just uh, the you know Targaryens themselves, all of them either died or mysteriously disappeared. So Arthur Dane clearly was um uh, then you get Oswald Went clearly died. Um Ashara Dane apparently died, disappeared. We hear that John Connington was a close ally. He goes off in exile and apparently dies, didn't really. We get um, uh, his two um, uh, squires, Rhaegar's two squires, um, both disappeared. Well, one died and the other one disappeared. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a running link all the way through it. Anyone who was connected with Rhaegar either died or made sure that they just disappeared because they knew they would face Robert Baratheon's wrath. So the House Dane itself as a whole disappeared. We don't know huge amounts about House Dane because they disappeared from public life for a long time. They are quite a, an ancient house, a, a renowned house, and yet they just they didn't appear at court at all during King uh, Robert's reign. They just kept very, very quiet. So that was the whole thing. It would have been more surprising if somebody did come out of the woodwork and say something, uh, because House Dane, they would all have died, almost certainly. Let's have a quick look in the chat. Um, Dominic Vaughan saying, Ashara and Howland are best self-isolating people we all know. This is true. There's some social distancing going on in the neck. That's for sure. Um, uh, Stephanie Frederick saying, thank you. I've listened to the Tower of Joy series over and over. Still wonder about it. Yep, I, I think it's true. I think it's a valid question. It's, it's one of the questions that is still out there. It doesn't change any theories on it. Um, it's just something we have not yet had answered. Um, uh, let's have a look. Um, Lady Pushkin says, hi, is it generally agreed that Ashara Dane faked her death to enable her relationship with Howland Reed? It is generally agreed on this channel. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody agrees with it, uh, but um, she, she was known to have died. Everybody accepts that uh, as a story, but they also accept the fact that her body was never found. Um, it is incredibly coincidental that that should happen just around the time when, as I say, otherwise she would be um, 
uh, very clearly on Robert Baratheon's radar as to what on earth happened. Um, so uh, as for what happens to her, whether, you know, is it generally accepted uh, that um, uh, she had a relationship with Howland? I, it's a theory that uh, I'm playing my small part in trying to popularise because I think I think it all adds up. Um, there are others who have other views. There are some people who think um, that um, maybe she's gone off somewhere in Essos into hiding. Uh, maybe she's Quaith or maybe she's Septila Moore. Actually, incidentally, I, my next video coming out tomorrow is who is Septila Moore. Uh, so if you're wondering who Septila Moore is, then uh, then uh, that video is coming out tomorrow. Um, spoiler alert, I don't think it's a Shara Dane. Um, that uh, so there are other people who've got other theories, but these theories don't tend to have any evidence behind them. They're just wouldn't it be cool if kind of theories. So uh, I, I'm not going to pretend that the entire um, fandom is behind this theory, but for me, it is by a long way the strongest uh, uh, theory on where she might be. Um, uh, let's uh, have a quick flick back, um, trying to see if there's any more questions go. Um, uh, Dominic Vaughan saying, I think Dominic, I've got a question from you coming up, but I've got a, uh, for over on Patreon, but I see you dropped one here in the chat as well, saying, do you think we will ever see the full use of blood royal sacrificial magic? We've had Lord stroke bastard son of a king stroke tenuous claims to royalty but what about a full king or reigning queen again um good question so i think that we will uh definitely have the same thing that we had on the show in terms of the baratheon blood sacrifice with melisandre um uh, i think what we also will have is uh, sorry shireen i should have said uh so she is the heir to the throne according to a lot of people so she has got royal blood um also in the south we've got euron who has tied uh, the woman who is pregnant with his child to the front of his boat and they will almost certainly die so he is also making a sacrifice in terms of getting an actual king or queen and sacrificing them, I'm not, I'm not sure we will see quite like that. Uh, very happy if anyone's got any ideas how that's going to happen. But I think that it's what we've had is various things kind of leading up to uh, the Shireen moment, which will be huge. Um, it was quite shocking on the show, and I think that is that the intention is. For it to be exactly the same in the books, it is supposed to make it go. Whoa, that was that was cold. That was heartless. Um, the the timing will also be interesting because there's a possibility that because Shireen and Stannis are not in the same place in the books on on the show, they were in the same place, and it was just about getting Stannis to Winterfell. Stannis is already a close to Winterfell, he doesn't need that. But John, if he's going to go to Winterfell, will need that. And it may even be after Stannis is dead, if Stannis dies in, in the battle um, uh, against the Boltons. If that's the case, Shireen, and I don't know whether it will be, honestly, but if it is the case, when Shireen is sacrificed, she would if you're going by this kind of Bar Baratheon bloodline, which is obviously what Ned was uh, was uh, in favour of, what uh, Stannis was was claiming was true, Shireen would be the rightful queen of the Seven Kingdoms. So uh, in that case, yes, we would have an actual living queen sacrificed. It may be that Melisandre wouldn't know it at the time, uh, but that is entirely possible that that's what's going to be going on. Um, 
Uh, okay, let's go for uh, one more question from Patreon uh, before I give a quick update on what's happening on the channel. This is uh, Maura Lee saying, what role do you see Littlefinger taking in the last two books? How will his character arc end? And if some does end him, do you think Sansa will have a hand in this? Yes, I think that's that's how it's going to be. I think that they will head up to Winterfell. Um, uh, I think that that is how Sansa is going to end up there. I think that she's going to go with Littlefinger. Um, and I think somehow along the line, uh, everything that Littlefinger has done will come out. Now, that might partly be Sansa, who uh, will suddenly realise all the things that he's been doing. Um, uh, and once she's on home territory and has some support, then she may well be able to start voicing those things because while she's been in the Eyrie, she's already seen him do a huge amount of things. She she's she's very aware that he double crossed her father. Um so she actually herself has got a huge amount of information there that she is holding within herself, but she, because she can't tell people while she's in uh well the veil, because the veil is all under little fingers control. So uh, only when she gets up to Winterfell and she has her people around her will she be able to um, uh, start thinking and acting on uh, all of these thoughts about whose side Littlefinger truly is on. Littlefinger, when I say he's in control of the veil, vale, the veil vale lords aren't 100% behind him and they probably would be okay with getting rid of him if needs be. So... Um, I think that Littlefinger has overplayed his hand uh, and it is because he thinks that the bond between him and Sansa is stronger than it actually is and she will play on that and that, that will, uh, hubris will be his end, his, his, his confidence, his pride before his fall that he thinks that he has won by taking Sansa back up and he thinks that he will be able to claim the North um, because. Uh, if, 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 as far as he's aware, all of the other uh, Starks uh, are gone, he may well even hear that John has died. Uh, Rob has obviously died. He may well be aware of uh, Bran and Rickon not being there. Arya's, who knows where. He may well be thinking, you know what, I can get Sansa up north, I can marry her, and I can be the ruler of uh, the north and the Vale. So that seems to be his plan, and I think that he will think that that is... Um, all very clever, but that pride will be his undoing. Okay, so uh, let's take a moment. Um, uh, Tubbs, thank you for saying I look like Littlefinger. It's the it's the the silver fox uh, 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 and that is starting to emerge. Um, the in terms of what's happening on the channel, as I said, I am focusing a lot on Westworld uh, at the moment. If you are, you know, if you enjoyed Westworld or perhaps got slightly um, uh, lost in season two, season three is a fantastic place to pick it up again. Uh, there's a, it's, um, it feels almost like a reboot. The robots out in in the outside world, uh, and it's a fantastically strong start. So please do go and check that out. If you are into Westworld, I've got a whole load of videos there. Uh, I've been creating videos all this week for Westworld, but. The uh, Song of Ice and Fire, the Lord of the Rings videos are going to carry on. Do not worry about that. Every Friday is the aim. This Friday, as I said, Scepter Lamore is the subject of my video coming out tomorrow. Who is Scepter Lamore? So uh, keep an eye out for them. These Thursday live streams will be carrying on uh, as normal. I imagine they'll mostly be focused on the Song of Ice and Fire or possibly Lord of the Rings, uh, while sort of the first half of the week is, is looking at Westworld. So uh, that's what's going on. My second channel, The Well Told Tale, The Well Told Tale, uh, we're looking or we're, we're working our way through Alice in Wonderland, which is a fantastic story, fantastic escapism for the world at the moment. Um, uh, so if you're at all interested in that, do go and check that out. Finally, patrons, thank you. I say it every week, but I mean it every week. I honestly cannot do what I do without your support. Uh, thank you so much. 
Um, if you are interested in supporting the channel, if you uh, want to get access to some of the things that I offer for my patrons, which is early access to uh, to my content, uh, some additional content I produce just for my patrons, uh, priority questions for live streams like this. Uh, if you're interested in any of that, there is a link to uh, in the description to my Patreon page. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I think we've got, unless I missed it. Yes, we did. We get, uh, so Gretchen, hi Gretchen, saying, uh, because of the HBO debacle, do you think George R. R. Martin has decided to change any major plot points, you know, because he likes to F with us? Now, um, no, is the short answer. Uh, I don't think that he has changed because of what's happened with um, the TV show. Um, now, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I've said this before. My overall view of what happened was we know that George R. R. Martin and the showrunners, they had a meeting which lasted several days where George R. R. Martin talked them through where he was at and where he thought the story would end. Now, we have to be aware of the fact that George R. R. Martin has not finished the story, so it could end in different ways. Um, uh, and he consistently says that he views himself as a, a gardener writer, so he discovers things as he's going along. So perhaps some things will naturally evolve to be different as they are going along. Um, I don't think we should take that uh, as 100 percent because clearly he puts in a huge amount of foreshadowing uh, and things like character arcs and stuff like that uh, early on in the story that do need to pay off. Uh, so um, yes, he will discover stuff as he's going along, but he is more and more constrained the further into the story he gets. Um, I think the showrunners went away with the sort of the headlines of what George R. R. Martin said and then decided that they would end, and George R. R. Martin has said this, this isn't just me giving my view, uh, that the major beats are the same, but uh, all the stuff leading to them and all the rest of it will not necessarily be the same. Specifically, the minor characters, George R. R. Martin has been very clear, they didn't discuss many of the minor characters. And by minor characters, I think we're talking about the sort of the uh, the jurors of this world, the bronze, the people like that, who they're not the, the, the headline characters, but they're, you know, we enjoyed their stories. Uh, I don't think George R. R. Martin really discussed how their stories would end uh, with the showrunners, so don't pay huge amounts of attention to what happened to them. In terms of the big things, uh, I think that they will be roughly the same, but... Uh, the framing and the context and how you get there will be and feel very different. So uh, the endings themselves will feel different because everything that's led up to it will be different. Uh, in terms of your question, do I think he's decided to change anything as a result of the show? No, I don't think so, because I think that he will look at the show and say, that's different. That's not what... I have been writing and building towards. There's there's huge amounts of character development and plot points and all the rest of it that they didn't include. Therefore, he will not recognise that as being the same as the story that he's writing. He is not writing fan fiction of the TV show. He is writing his story, and then they, if anything, wrote fan fiction of his story. That's the way around it goes. I don't think he's changing anything, but that's because the two stories will be uh, different enough. Um... Let's have a, so Kat May, uh, thank you so much for the super chat, saying, why didn't Marjorie choose Jamie as her champion in A Feast for Crows? Um, is it not a great move against Cersei or is underage Tommen a setback? Thank you for all the content. Um, yeah, I mean, she could have done. I think that the, the, the fact is that, um, Jamie's off and about to start with, um, but also the the Tyrells and the Lannisters, it's on the show they were, yes, there was kind of like a little bit of tension, but in the books this is very clearly two families grappling for control of uh, of King's Landing and the Seven Kingdoms more broadly. So 
Marjorie would not wish to have uh, a, a Lannister on her side who she does not think that uh, they, they will not be 100% on her team. So uh, I think we need to say in the wider context of what the Tyrells are about. The Tyrells are trying to wrest control away from the Lannisters, uh, and that is um, uh, that is the context. With um, uh, Jamie and Cersei, I don't think anyone thinks that the rift between them is as great as we do because we see into their minds. So to the outside world, they are still incredibly close twin twins and all the rest of it. And I mean, they are still close, don't get me wrong, but in the books, obviously, obviously you can see the growing tensions between them. Um, got a question from Gis Mulders saying, if House Dane was so involved in the Tower of Joy, why didn't Rhaegar and Lyanna just stay in Starfall? Why do you think they quarantined themselves in the Dornish Mountains instead? Um, a very good question. Uh, I think that the answer is because, although I say, yes, this wasn't a huge secret, they didn't want it to be something that everybody knew. And I think that, uh, that there's a big difference between having a few hand-picked servants working their way over and um, uh, provisioning the... Uh, the the tower and all the rest of it. You could you could choose as Ned did. He chose his half dozen people he thought that he could absolutely trust. I think the Danes similarly could have chosen half dozen people that they absolutely trust, and be reasonably confident that that would be kept uh, a, a secret enough. Um, if the crown prince and his pregnant girlfriend slash wife or whatever they were at the time and three members of the King's Guard all descended on Starfall, that would not be a secret. Everybody in Starfall would be aware of it. Um, the, the people in the stables would be aware of it. Where are these magnificent horses come from? The people who, the armourers would be aware of it. Um, people would recognise Arthur Dane because he was, he was famous and all the rest of it. So uh, that would no longer be a secret. This was, in, it had to be secret enough, but uh, some people would have to know. So my, my take is that House Dane would just picked the half dozen or so people that they could trust the most rather than exposing the entire household uh, to the secret. Okay. Um, and... Um, I think I've got another question up here. Um, uh, yeah, Andrew Kay saying, yeah, uh, about George R. R. Martin saying, pretty sure George R. R. Martin says he has a plan and is sticking with it. He won't opt for cheap pivots. Uh, he will follow through on the foundations he built. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I think that that sort of sums some up. Incidentally, yes, one of the upsides potentially of uh, of what's going on around in the world with the coronavirus and all the rest of it is that George R. R. Martin may well be, he's, he said he is now focusing in on his book because, you know, he has to socially isolate. So uh, fingers crossed there is going to be some silver linings coming out of all of this. Uh, the Warded Ginger, thank you so much for the super chat, saying thank you for creating amazing content. Thank you. Uh, first time catching a live stream and it's been great. Uh, uh, welcome then. Uh, if it's your first time here, I love it when people d discover the live stream. Um, uh, which plot line are you most looking forward to in the Winds of Winter? Uh, I think the one, well, there are a lot, but I think the one that I've been looking at most recently is probably the one that I'm most intrigued by, which is what happens with Fagon, Aegon the Sixth, who, and it might be because it's not in the show, so we haven't got anything really to go on. We have to just experience it. Uh, but he has launched an invasion and he is very probably going to be attacking King's Landing soon. There's a very good chance he's going to take King's Landing. Um, this is such a radical departure from the show uh, that I just, I can't wait to see it happening. It's just, it's just fantastic. So um, uh, not only do we have the, who is this person, uh, but then we have the, what happens when, if he does take uh, King's Landing when he is king, 
what what does that mean with Cersei and the Lannisters? Where are they going to go off to? What happens when Danny arrives and she discovers this other person already there? So many so many unknowns that need to be tied together, and I I'm really looking forward to discovering that. So I, I think it's a, and added to which there are these other things like. Who is Septula Moore? What's going on with John Connington? The Grey Scale is he going to affect people? So many, so many sort of subplots going on within that. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, where that storyline uh, going. Uh, <laughs> Lady Leaf Underhill saying, "Are you saying Bron will not be Master of Coin?" Yes, uh, Maura Lee. Thank you so much for everyone in the chat and the great discussion. Thank you, Maura. Thank you. I really appreciate that. that's that's very kind with the super chat. Um, uh, we've got another question. Let's see. Well, I'm sure I did get another question. If I can find it. Uh, Brandon Winslow, thank you for the super chat. I can't see a question attached to that one. That's very kind. Um, if you have got one, uh, perhaps uh, one of the moderators could try and pick that one up in the chat and flag it up for me. That would be uh, great. But thank you so much. Uh, Dominic Vaughan, thank you again, uh, saying, thanks, Robert. Your content is like a glass candle. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, high credit, a light in a dark time and helping to keep us positive and cheery currently. Well, I, if I can do that, then I will, I will feel that I've, I've done a great service. So thank you so much. I, um, uh, I do try and keep things upbeat and positive. So, um, uh, if, if that comes through, then I'm delighted about that. Um, uh, uh, Fango 2, 2k grayscale pandemic. Yes. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's, um, the the grayscale is one of these things which it's been sort of around in the background of of the story for a long time and uh, it will come to the fore at some point very soon almost certainly through john connington because he is hiding this because he doesn't really know um what to do about it um it's almost certain that he will pass it on and then what happens uh, if it gets out into the population of King's Landing, uh, how do you deal with an outbreak like that? Um, we've got lots of, this is a complete aside, but uh, we've got lots of examples in uh, things like uh, the World of Ice and Fire and, and so on, where you get cities that have got outbreaks of things and the rulers have to decide what to do with them. and. Um, Maybe they just let it work its way through the population. Maybe they decide to evacuate, wall people in, they burn them. There's a huge amount of different possibilities there. Um, I think that the link between uh, what we saw in the show with the burning of King's Landing is going to be there. Uh, and uh, with the spread of grayscale, if, if I had to guess, there is... Uh, something that happened in history in the mid 17th century in London, where you've got the great plague, which was going all the way through London. Um, and that really was only ended by the great fire of London, which burned down most of London, two huge tra tragedies, one after the other. That's the kind of bit, bits of history that George R. R. Martin loves trying to replicate. And if we have um, uh, some sort of uh, plague, followed by some sort of burning that I think would work because King's Landing, it's not played up huge amounts, but it is sort of London um, that if you had to pick a city that it's most based on, then you would have to say uh, it's most based on London. So that would kind of work, I think. Um, uh, Maura Lee, thank you again. Uh, that's uh, very kind saying, once Fagon launches his invasion and takes King's Landing, what will be Bloodraven's role since he may be a Blackfire? Uh, I think Bloodraven, uh, I mean, Bloodraven's always interested in what's going on, but Bloodraven uh, by that point may well already have been subsumed within the Weirwood network. I think that um, Bran will be heading south again, similar to the show. I don't think it'd be exactly the same for the show, but I think that Bloodraven himself will uh, get killed but the Weirwood Network will continue and Bran as the sort of successor, Three-Eyed Crow, will head south. Now, 
the bigger question is what does the Weirwood network care about who's in charge of King's Landing? Well, not so much as it cares about what is going on uh, with Jon Snow and with defence of the North against uh, the others. So I don't think they're going to be that concerned. Um, I think it's more a matter of when Daenerys arrives. That's going to be the big thing. King's Landing is the focus of this struggle for power with the Iron Throne, but it's not necessarily the focus, uh, uh, the thematic focus of the story itself, which tends to be a lot more around the Isle of Faces, Harren Hall, uh, and sort of the crossroads where the inner the crossroads is. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that um, Blood Raven will have an interest, but not as big an interest as we might think. Um, uh, and sorry, Shannon T was sort of following up on that question that whether Blood Raven knows about Fagon. So they, I, th I think the the knowledge of the Weirwood Network does seem to be focused in on Westeros because uh, the Weirwood trees can't sort of uh, it would appear go uh, over or through stone, huge amounts of stone, or over. Uh, huge amounts of sort of running water so they don't appear that they don't appear to be any weirwoods in essos all that we see from the sort of the learning that, that we get from bran and blood raven all the rest of it it seems to be very westeros focused so uh, i think there's a fairly good chance that uh blood raven's slightly blindsided about um uh fagon although um you have to always understand that the Weirwood Network do not see things in this kind of time linear fashion. All events to them seem to be happening at the same time. So if if Fagon at any point appears in Westeros, then I think that Bloodraven will be aware uh, and always has been and always will have been aware, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so I didn't see who said it. Uh, Floris the Fox saying George R. R. Martin is probably killing Stannis as we speak. It's entirely possible. Um, uh, okay, I think I'm caught up on questions. Um, Amy True saying uh, one of the previous Lord Hightowers got murdered for quarantining Old Town. Yes, yeah, so I think that the the, the, uh, the examples there George R. R. Martin has put in uh, of there being. Uh, quarantining of a city and the, the need, you know, what the impact of that is uh, on the, the, the population as a whole. Vampris99 saying, thank you for the feedback, by the way, saying it's interesting to think of George R. R. Martin's writing in light of present circumstances. Yeah, I, th I think it, he, because he gets a lot of his inspirations from history, I think that means that a lot of the things that we, until very recently, have sort of almost taken for granted, uh, he doesn't like the idea that you know we would be you know, almost immune to the, all of the plagues and things out there in the world. Uh, in almost all of human history, when there has been some new disease, it has absolutely devastated the population. And George R. R. Martin has, is a great student of history and he will be very aware of this. And so in his creation, disease uh, is, it plays a huge part. It plays a huge part if you see what over in Marine, it plays a huge part as we've already talked about what's happened in, uh, in with the high towers in Old Town, uh, Again, in if you look at the Duncan Egg novels, you you get the um, uh, the spring sickness killing so many people. This is a huge theme which comes through again and again in his writings because he understands that in that kind of civilization, this was a huge thing. Even if we typically haven't previously thought about it as being such a huge thing in in the sort of the modern Western world. Um, uh, Vampris 99, thank you so much for the super chat, saying it's one thing to be influenced by historical sources, it's another to be in the position as a writer to be able to tap into history 
and present circumstance. Yeah, that's very true. He's um, uh, George R. R. Martin is in a the position where he can uh, influence as well as reflect. So um, I, I, I'm not sure the extent to which he will choose to do that. I, th I think he's going to stick to his guns with his story. He's very much signed up to the Tolkien idea of stories should be applicable rather than allegorical. So I think that um, uh, he, he wants us to take lessons from it, but doesn't want to spoon feed us those lessons. If that makes sense. Uh, uh, Susan D, um, uh, thank you for the super chat saying, is it okay to ask questions about Westworld uh, or is it too early or off topic? I'm super excited about this season. Um, yes, I, I'm, this is an open Q&A so you can ask questions about anything. What I was planning on doing was I was going to work my way through the Song of Ice and Fire questions and then get on to Westworld at the, uh, the end of the stream. Uh, so uh, if I will try and keep an eye out for you. If you have got any questions, uh, I will try and uh, pick up on them. Uh, Donald Peoples um, has gone straight in with a question on, on it. I will, Donald, if that's okay with you, uh, I will answer that one. Uh, let me just drop that into my uh, working document. I will try and uh, answer your question on uh, Westworld uh, a little bit later, if that's okay. Um, and is that me caught up? I think that's me caught up now. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to a question. Uh, but yes, I love questions on Westworld. I will, I will uh, just pile them up and answer them at the at the end while we're while we're on a roll with uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Let's keep on going with that. Um, uh, let's go with a question from uh, Dominic Vaughan. I told you I had a question from you. Uh, over on Patreon. So this relates to Varys. His arc in the TV show seems to end with getting Danny to Westeros. Do you think it will be any more nuanced and complex in the books? And if so, how? Yes, it will be, because uh, on the show, he was very much in Team Danny. In the books, he's not. In the books, he's Team Fagon, Team uh, Aegon the Sixth. Uh, he is working behind the scenes to try and ease his way in. In fact, the, the last chapter we get of the Dance of Dragons is him um, working in King's Landing, uh, killing Kevin Lannister and Grand Maester Pycelle uh, in order to sow uh, some problems in King's Landing. Um, he basically told Kevin Lannister, actually, you know what, you're a bit too competent at your job, uh, so I have to get rid of you so that it's easier for Fagon to come in and take uh, take King's Landing. So that's what's uh, that's what he's doing. So uh, he won't be part of Team Danny. In fact, he will be opposed to D Team Danny when she arrives, uh, as she surely will, to find that Aegon the Sixth, Fagon, is in King's Landing. I think that he will. Um, uh, however, I think the one thing that that will be similar in the books is his fate. I think that he will be burned by Drogon. That that's pretty inevitable. Uh, okay. Fedra the Beloved saying, if John gets Dawn, what happens to Longclaw? And not entirely unrelated, what do you think is the end game for Jorah Mormont? Um, okay, so we've got uh, two questions there. Um, uh, in terms of Jorah Mormont, I think he's one of these that I don't think we can necessarily take what happened on the show as a, as a good barometer of what will hap happen with him. However, I think that he is, seems to be on something of a redemption arc, um, which I think will end up with him in the North being pardoned by John in some way. I think that, that is that is where he will go. He left the North. He was... Um, uh, he was um, the lord, or the effectively the lord of um, Bear Island, uh, so House Mormont. Um, so J.R. Mormont, his father, had uh, gone off and joined the Night's Watch, leaving him in charge. He squandered it all away uh, and even went to the extent of trying to sell some people into slavery. Uh, and Ned was on his way effectively to behead him when he scarpered. So uh, 
he that's the starting point for his journey the end point for his journey has to be in some way uh him it doesn't have to be george R. martin loves playing around with these things but the logical end point for his journey is for him to get pardoned by the current lord of winterfell and somehow uh for j or mormont blessing to be put upon him now all of that has to come through john because john will be the lord of winterfell uh, rob almost certainly bequeathed it to him in his will and john was uh, not only the successor to Gerald mormont as the uh, lord commander of the night's watch but also obviously took on this role as kind of like a surrogate son and he gave him long claw which was the sword that jorah was supposed to have um uh, and all the rest of it so it has to come through john so his story arc is less about daenerys and more about bringing him up to the north and uh getting some kind of uh catharsis forgiveness redemption something focused around john so that's that's where his character arc is going um, and saying if John gets Dawn, what happens to Longclaw? I don't think John necessarily does get Dawn. Uh, I mean, he might, uh, but uh, if he does, what happens to Longclaw? Perhaps he does give it to Jorah. That that would certainly be a good symbol of uh, of this kind of forgiveness and taking him back because Jorah had it. He was given it by his father, and then when he he left on the run, he he left it because he knew he did not deserve it so to be given the sword by john would be a a symbol of the fact that actually you are an honorable man uh yes you had you did terrible things but you have made up for them in other ways so that i think is what we're uh, we're looking there with that uh brandon winslow thank you so much for the super chat uh, again didn't see a question attached to that one uh but uh oh yes there is so chrissy Boldstone says uh what is your favorite the winds of winter chapter and why um uh thank you chrissy for picking up on that one um <coughs> pardon me uh, i think so we've we've got the pre-release chapters from the winds of winter we've we've not got that many we have got quite a few i suppose but um they're not all fully written out some of them george R. R. martin just read out um of the ones we've got i don't I mean i don't it's quite hard i think probably mercy which is the one that i was talking about earlier um which is the aria chapter it shows that there's a huge amount in there there's there's the link across with the dire wolves there's her uh, being her character, it's set in Bravos, which I, as a city I love. There's huge amounts of her moving through Bravos and us getting a feel of the city. Um, uh, so there's that there. There's this huge new range of characters. She joins this theatre troupe uh, for us to be meeting. And there's this internal struggle with her between her new life and, and her old one, uh, which which works really well, I think, as a chapter. So um, I, I think as a well-rounded chapter, I think that one works very well. There are others. I mean, so the Theon cap, uh, chapter, I think, works very well. It is quite static, but I think it gets us from one point to another point. Uh, the Sansa chapter, we get lots of hints about where she's going and, and see a lot more in her development as a character. There's a lot of great chapters out there, but uh, that's the thing. I think Mercy uh, is the chapter that I, uh, I like the most. Um, uh, Violent Messiah 666 says, I hope Jorah takes the black like uh, Lord Commander Mormont wanted. Yeah, it's possible. That's another, that's a good way of him getting this kind of like uh, sort of forgiveness or something along those lines. Um, uh, let's, I think I had another super chat. Uh, Sylvia Tanner, thank you so much, saying, Ever since I heard the Rolling Stones song Paint It Black, I've been wondering if anyone has adapted the song from Daenerys' point of view. Are you aware of such a parody? Um, I'm not. Um, 
If anyone's adapted the song from Daenerys book, no, I'm not aware of that. I, I, I'm just, I'm just trying to work my way through. I've, I've seen some uh, fantastic people putting music to um, Daenerys in that uh, penultimate episode of the show, um, uh, where I think somebody put it. I think it was Metallica song to it, which worked absolutely wonderful. Oh yeah, oh, yes, because it was, it was to do with uh, the, the tolls, so it's for him, the belt tolls. Um, uh, and it works brilliantly well. Uh, so um, I haven't there. In terms of Paint It Black, though, it does, and we will talk about it in a little bit, but in it works perfectly in Westworld. Uh, Roman Jalili works it amazingly well uh, with this, the, the heist scene, both in season one, and then reinterpreting the same song for a different uh, scenario that echoes the first scenario and it's, it's it's a wonderful I mean he's clearly a fantastic composer but not just a composer an adapter of music that draws links thematic links between different bits of a show through the music not just like having a cool soundtrack to the music so um, no I, don't, I haven't and in terms of an answer to your specific question I, I haven't heard of anyone uh, adapting it from that from Daenerys point of view, but I, for, for Westworld, I it, I think it worked perfectly. Um, uh, let's have a look. I've got uh, Sonata Systems. Thank you, sir, Super Chat, just saying for your COVID-19 TP hoarding fund. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm... Uh, uh, I, I'm okay today. I found some. It, we're we're all good on that front. But thank you. I very much appreciate it. I um I I made a special trip out and and I'm now fully stocked up on that. Uh, uh, not hoarding because I think that that's uh, that's not a good thing to do. But I'm doing all right. Uh, but thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Jake Shepard, thank you so much. Saying you've mentioned in the past that you feel Tyrion may come back from his dark turn in the books. If he were to make a redemption, how do you think that will be done? Um, I mean, I think this is an excellent question. I, I think, so Tyrion in the books is a lot darker than he was on the show. Um, and he is uh, very much wanting to uh, eventually get back to Westeros. He wants, there's a lots of grudges he holds. Um, I think his redemption will ultimately come from him putting other people before himself. Tyrion, uh, as, as a, is a fantastic character, but he always puts himself first. Um, when he sees or understands what's going on uh, with the threat from the others. Uh, when he realizes um, that there is also an existential threat from the dragons, and he realizes that actually somebody needs to pull all of this together, and get humanity working in the same way. And actually he's probably best set to do this because he is, because he's the person out of out of all of the characters, he's the person who's who's been to all of the places. If you think about it, he 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 knows King's Landing. He's spent time at King's Landing, so all of that is there. He's got links in with the Lannisters and Tyrells and all the rest of it. He's been all the way up to the Wall. He's been to uh, to to Winterfell. He's met Bran. He knows Jon. Um, uh, he's been over to Marine. He will now uh, or he's going there anyway, and he will. He's met Aegon the Sixth. Um, uh, he's going to meet Daenerys. Tyrion, out of all of the characters, is the one person who is the fulcrum of all of this. He's the person who everybody intersects with him. Uh, so he will be the person who sees the big picture fundamentally. Um, he will be the person who can actually try and bring people together in the end. And I think that is where, uh, and I don't think it's going to be a, clear-cut redemptive arc. I don't think George R. R. Martin does clear-cut redemptive arcs. I think that he's still going to be, um, let's say, rough around the edges. Um, but I think that the fact that he is the centre of this story, not necessarily the hero, not necessarily the greatest protagonist, but 
he is the center of this story means that uh, he will be in the ultimate position to be guiding people towards the end. And I think that will be where he gets his opportunity to put others before his own uh, desires. Um, uh, right, uh, Mark Kina saying, finally catching this live. Welcome, Mark. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, uh, I think that's me caught up on uh, the chat now. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Amy True, just very quickly, uh, do you buy into Tyrion being a secret Targaryen? I've, I've said this before. This is the theory that I move about on the most. Uh, by this stage, I've been looking at these books for a long time. Uh, by this stage, most things I've come to a reasonably clear idea on, on where we're at, what's going on. The one theory that I shift about on the most is this is Tyrion the Targaryen because depending on which part of the books I read the evidence seems very strong in both ways so um uh, I will I, I will happily say at the moment it it could go either way George R. Martin could write it either way or as I think is most likely he will leave it slightly unclear uh, and we will have to kind of read into it and come to our own so um, uh, maybe one day I will do another video. I think I did a video on this ages, literally years ago on this subject. Um, maybe I will have another go at this and try and come down firmly on one side or the other. But honestly, I, I move around on this more than any other theory, I have to say. Uh, Cat May, thank you so much for the Superjet, saying, what is your opinion on Patchface's role? Do you think that he has a significant connection to the drowned god or not? Could he be a water white? Oh, so Patchface is also on a list of videos I want to make at some point because he's a fascinating character. For those who don't know, he's um, uh, effectively he's the court jester for Stannis. Stannis isn't really, um, he, he's not a big fan of jesters, as you could well imagine, or fools. Um, uh, but he is very attached to Shireen, and she loves him. Uh, uh, Melisandre doesn't. She doesn't trust him, doesn't like him at all. Now, that's partly because he's very associated with water, and she obviously is very associated with fire, and fire doesn't like water. Now, the question as to whether he might be a water white is, is based uh, on the fact that he was, there's a whole history here, but he was, uh, when he arrived, um, he was fished out of the water and was apparently drowned and dead for six days and then sort of came back. So uh, whether you think that that's literal or whether it was just, a, you know, he'd been floating around and just about survived, uh, he clearly has a conceptual link across to the water. He does seem to have some kind of magical insights that he he weaves into his ridiculous little rhymes that he does um do i think he's a water white no do i think that he um has a significant connection to the drowned god i think if anything it's closer i think to uh the sort of the water magic of the Roinar. i think that's closer to where his sort of his heart is um or if not his heart, then that's where his sort of his magic comes from. Uh, so I think that's that's more about it. I think that Melisandre just doesn't like anyone who is magical, who is not on her side. Um, will he have a significant uh, role? I don't think it's going to be huge, but I think that we will see that uh, if Shireen, well, when Shireen gets burned, he will not take this lightly and I think that he will then be coming after whoever is involved in doing this uh, which is probably going to be Melisandre so I think we're going to see quite a, a confrontation going on uh, there at some point. Okay uh, questions let's go back to um, uh, Chase this is a question 
saying, hi, Robert, wishing you and everybody watching this safe and healthy week. I was wondering what you make of the vision Bran has of the Winterfell weirwood tree in the past. I especially always wondered who is the pregnant woman wanting revenge? What are your thoughts about it? Uh, okay, so this is uh, Bran uh, has visions. He's uh, sort of when he's starting to awaken his weirwood magic, he has visions through the weirwood tree when he's up in Bloodraven's cave, but he sees through the Winterfell weirwood tree and he sees uh, a number of different images. He sees his father there, um, uh, and uh, he sees things all the way going, what appears to be a long way back in history, uh, when the Weirwood tree is a lot smaller. He also sees uh, a pregnant woman coming out of the pool, um, uh, calling for vengeance against the, what, the, the, her. She will have a son so that he will be able to have vengeance against those who've wronged her. Um, there's no other context to this. It's literally half a sentence and then we move on. Uh, Bran has this whole series of visions, one after the other. Before it, we get uh, a vision of two children play fighting uh, in the Godswood. One of them uh, looks like Arya. The suggestion is that that is Lyanna and Benjen. So that's the vision he has beforehand. The vision he has afterwards is of uh, a young woman on her tiptoes kissing a very tall knight, um, as tall, he noted, as Hodor. Uh, the suggestion is that this is probably Sir Duncan the Tall, and perhaps that's Old Nan. <coughs> Pardon me. So, the um, uh, given the fact that these visions seem to be going back in time, we're looking at something which is further back in time than when uh, Leanna and Benjamin were young, but not quite as far back in time as uh, when Dunk visits Winterfell. Now, Dunk is going to visit Winterfell in um, the next, as far as we're aware, this is what George R. Martin's plan is anyway, the next Dunk and Egg story, uh, the, which is going to be called The She-Wolves of Winterfell. So what about the gap in the middle there? What's what's going to happen there? Well, we don't know huge amounts about the detail, but uh, what we do have is uh, a, a few throwaway comments from George R. R. Martin about what the plot of the She-Wolves of Winterfell will be. And he says that um, there are, I think he said there are five... Um, Stark ladies who uh, are, I think he says, they're all bereaved. So uh, they, they've lost their husbands or lovers or something like that. So And, and they are known as the She-Wolves of Winterfell. And the plot is going to be obviously something along the lines of Duncan Egg getting up there and getting mixed up in some kind of uh, power play between these various characters. Now, um, uh, we don't know, as I say, we don't know who all, the, who all of those women may be, but it seems to make sense that if there is, at the time that we're looking, um, a whole load of uh, uh, stark women who have lost uh, husbands or lovers, uh, it would certainly make sense that a woman in the Godswood uh, who is pregnant and is wanting vengeance is one of those women. So that seems to be what is is going on there. So it's 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 probably we're going to discover who it is in the next Duncan Egg story. So this is actually this is George R. R. Martin doing a little placing a little Easter egg that we're only going to know what it is after we've read that next story. So. Uh, the short answer is we don't know yet, because George R. R. hasn't told us yet. But when that story comes out, we'll be able to go back and go, oh, yeah, so that's who that was. Um, uh, Brian Holiday, thank you for the super chat, saying, just read the prologue of Assos. It was good to, A Storm of Swords, sorry. It was good to get the perspective of someone lowborn. John is a bastard and Sam is a coward. 
but they're still highborn. Sam can read and John was taught how to fight. Yeah. So this is this is something that George R. Martin does quite a lot with um, prologues and epilogues and things like that, is to give us different perspectives on the action, often from people who aren't highborn. So, um, uh, yeah, John and Sam, we might think of them as being, you know, having had hard upbringings and all the rest of it, but we must never... I, th I think George R. Martin would not wish us to ever lose sight of the fact that the vast majority of the story we're reading is about the 1% of Westeros. We're talking about the lords and ladies. We're talking about the people right at the top of society. We're not talking about uh, the, the farmers and the, uh, the people working in the pubs and the fisher people and all the rest of it. This is, uh, we're, we're hearing the stories of the noble lords and ladies. So, Every now and then he gives us just a little hint of something from another angle that allows us to get in perspective what is going on. And I think that this is one of the things he's wanting us to understand is quite how much of an impact all of these power plays amongst the mighty have on ordinary people. He just sort of drops it in every now and then. Some characters don't pay any attention and some do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think it's one of his strengths as a writer is that he allows us um, to see things from the, the perspectives that we otherwise might miss. Uh, Violent Messiah 666 saying old man and dunk equals canon. Uh, yeah, well, certainly my head canon, uh, it has to be said. Um, uh, it's possible that might turn out to be somebody else, but we will um, we'll have to wait and see. Um, okay, let's, we've got, um, oh, Donald Peoples, thank you so much, uh, saying, I believe Rickon will die, but do you think he has or had the potential to be a more powerful warg or green seer than Bran, or was it just a green dreams? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a, uh, something which comes up as speculation a lot, um, and I think I would go with it, which is that Bran potentially uh, is more powerful. Sorry, Rickon potentially is more powerful than Bran. Now, uh, Rickon really is a very, very young child at the start of this. So um, it's easy to sort of overlook him and all the rest of it. Um, but you'll find that when Ned dies and Bran has this kind of like weird feeling and, and you know, Blood Raven kind of like tries to guide him down into the crypts, uh, Rickon's already there. He claims he's seen uh, his father there as well. Um, it's, uh, he's clearly got some magical powers over and above what Bran had at that stage. Um, there are various hints, I mean, um, various hints that the eyes, the eyes of green seers tend to be green, um, and actually shaggy dog's eyes are green, um, not any of the other dire wolves. So that kind of hints at that. Um, and there, there's also the fact that when we get Mira and Jojen, they go hunting not for Bran. They are sent to collect, not Bran by name, but uh, the uh, the winged wolf that has been chained. Now, the wings clearly uh, see, uh, are sort of about flying. The uh, Blood Raven's sort of analogy for using magic is flying. So it is being held back by being in chains. But actually, if you take it slightly more literally, one of the dire wolves is in chains, and that is Shaggy Dog, Rickon's wolf. So if they're truly looking for the uh, the dire wolf in chains that uh, has wings, because there's clearly some magical power there, there's no reason why they shouldn't look at Rickon first. Um, but they don't, um, because Rand's older, perhaps. So, yeah, it's entirely possible. Um, Whatever it is, Bran is the one who goes up. 
Uh, and that is clearly who was always going to go up if we're going from the weirwood uh, outside of time kind of perspectives. So it's sort of a, an academic discussion. Um, uh, I agree. I think he will die, but I think that he did potentially have more potential power than branded. Um, uh, let's go one. Uh, I think. Oh, let's one more question. I think about a song of ice and fire from my patrons. Uh, so, if you've got any more questions about song of ice and fire, now is the time to drop them into the chat, and then I'll move on and do a couple of questions uh, about Westworld. Uh, Helen's little sister says, uh, "I don't have a specific question about characters, um, but I was curious about your favourite part of the story for a song of ice and fire, Westworld, or Lord of the Rings." Um, uh, for her, there's nothing better than Tyrion and King's Landing scenarios. Yeah, I think that, um, uh, I, well, I love most of the Tyrion sections and, uh, I, again, it's probably because I've just been recently reading them, uh, but the sections when he's on the Shy Maid in Essos and he's there traveling down uh, the river Rhoyne, and he's slowly figuring out what's going on that boat. I think they are absolutely fantastic because the context is he gets dropped on there by Illyrio and it becomes obvious that this is a boat full of people with secrets. It's a boat full of people who are not necessarily who they claim they are. Uh, and we see through his eyes as he is working out who everybody is um, and how he kind of like ingratiates himself with each of them and figures them all out. It's it's a wonderful sort of like um, way of, of getting into Tyrion's mind and understanding how uh, he's not only seeing this as like a mental challenge, but how he's becoming more himself again, having felt, you know, right down to the very bottom uh, when he shot his father and got sort of bundled out of King's Landing and all the rest of it and was... Uh, didn't really have much hope in, in life. This is him, his brain starting to tick back into the gear, trying to figure out uh, who these people are. So I, I love that section. Um, in terms of uh, The Lord of the Rings, um, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think the bits I love them in. I think I genuinely love the early parts with the fellowship all together and the integration of the characters uh, that just works beautifully for me when they kind of spit apart. Um, I still obviously still love it, but, uh, but I think you lose a lot of the interactions between the, the different characters, which for me were absolute joy. So I think that those early sections, when you get the, um, the, the fellowship as a whole going through Moriah, uh, Moriel, pardon me, um, things like that, they they work wonderfully for me. As for Westworld, I, I can't I'd pick a scene other than the fact to say Westworld season one, I think as as a discrete bit of TV is about as good as TV gets. It's It sets everything up. It, uh, it delivers with perfect acting, fantastic music. Uh, the set was great. The plot was wonderful. Just enough mystery to keep you going guessing uh, through to the end and then bringing it all together in a satisfying and yet quite shocking way if you've not seen it before. So, um, yeah, I would I would say so far in Westworld, season one is where uh, I am at. Um, Brian Holiday, thank you so much, saying, do you think that the Lord of the Crossing game, played by Big and Little Walder and Rickon from uh, Clash of Kings, is foreshadowing for the Red Wedding? Uh, yes, yeah, so the the two frays are in Winterfell um, in that early time after uh, Rob has headed off with the army down south and Bran's technically in charge. Um, we get a big and little Walder who are up there and they're playing games with uh, with Rickon and, and Bran to an extent as well. Um, they have have this game, sort of the Lord of the Crossing game, um, which is about, uh, it's, it's a game, so the, the phrase obviously are Lords of the Crossing, 
And so this is a game played by the phrase, uh, which is effectively to show how powerful it is to be in charge of uh, the crossing. Is it foreshadowing for the Red Wedding? Uh, possibly. I mean, it, yeah, George R. R. Martin does do a lot of these things. He was he had planned the Red Wedding by that point, definitely. Uh, and so the interactions between the Starks and the phrase were definitely a part of this. Uh, I, I think that there are other bits of foreshadowing, like Daenerys' uh, visions in the House of the Undying. Uh, but yes, I, th I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go with it that yes, it is. The, the, the phrase are there not just to sort of um, add colour and for people to talk to. They are um, that they do add to the kind of the layers of uh, um, uh, uh, enmity is too strong a word, but the sort of friction between the Starks and the phrase. Um, uh, okay, I think that's it. Let me just have a quick flick through. Um, uh, see if there's any more questions that I've missed on this one. Da, 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 da. Okay, I think what I will do is I will move. Please uh, do. Um, oh, Maura Lee's asking whether Rob tried to walk into Grey Wind before he and his dire wolf was killed. Quite possibly, yes. Um, there's that, that's the sort of the the, the strongly hinted uh, thing that comes through in in the books. But Grey Wind is also killed, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's short lived, um, and it is there as one of the things, one of the beats that George R. R. Martin is wanting us to be thinking about, just lodging thoughts in the back of our brain, what happens when John dies? John will, I'm personally convinced, will walk into a um, uh, ghost. So the idea that Rob might have walked into Grey Wind, even if it's only very briefly, is certainly um, the case. And the fact that they put... put uh, Grey Wind's head on his shoulders, I think, shows as well this sort of symbolically that they become one because he is both of them. Uh, okay, let's go across to uh, a couple of quick questions about Westworld. Uh, Morley's asking who is in Charlotte Hale's host body, uh, Teddy or Peter Abernathy or someone else? Um, uh, so there is Charlotte, Dolores escaped into the real world in Charlotte Hale's body. She put herself back into her own body. And then we get this other character we've got who now one of the other hosts that uh, Dolores, I, I always say Daenerys when I'm trying to say Dolores, Dolores for the, the links are I think quite strong. Um, the question is who she put into Charlotte now. The if you've seen the trailer, the most recent trailer they did, the sort of the in coming weeks trailer that uh, I did a trailer breakdown of. If you're interested, that you find it on my channel. I did that one just a couple of days ago. That uh, clearly shows that whoever is in that body is um, a slightly more sensitive soul than perhaps someone like Angela. It's also somebody that. Dolores feels quite connected to. We see a, a picture of them sort of lying on a bed next to each other, kind of spooning, and uh, Dolores is, is sort of being quite comforting. I think that that leaves three possible people. Uh, I think you're right on two of them, Teddy, Peter Abernathy, her father, uh, or possibly Clementine. Those are the three people that she would have that kind of um, link to. Of the three, um, I think that the most likely is Teddy. Uh, I think that that's in, indeed Maeve in that very same trailer, talking possibly even to Charlotte, we didn't see, does say, is that you in there, Teddy? So she does seem to be uh, thinking that Teddy's somewhere. Um, it kind of makes sense. And the, the, the only hint we get is that image that I said about lying on the bed does mirror the image that we had at the towards the end of season two when she's uh, lying next to his dead body. That, that it seems a deliberate mirroring of that image. So uh, 
Um, my guess is it's Teddy, but uh, it could be either of those other two people that I was talking about. Um, uh, Susan Dunkel, thank you for the super chat, saying Dolores brought five pearls with her. She did. Maybe Angela, Clementine, Teddy, Bernard, and Abernathy. What is your guess? One is in Hale, another is in the Insight Officer, and then Bernard. Do you have a guess for the others? Yeah, I think that is a really strong list of who she might have brought with her. So she has to have brought with her people that she trusts. I think that's the first thing. So the most likely set of people are the people that she had as part of her gang in season two. Uh, now, that obviously includes Teddy, uh, that obviously includes um, uh, Angela, um, Bernard, she definitely has brought there already. I think Peter Abernathy, her father, yes, she might want to, to bring him back to. Um, that's the point at which you start to start to run out of people possibly that she could have um, a connection to. So um, uh, I, th I think the people you've mentioned are the most likely out of everybody that we've got there. I mean, I, I struggle to think of anyone else that she would particularly trust. I think we have to open up the possibility that, um, because Westworld does go weird places, that she might have got two of her. Um, that's possible. Uh, there's no reason why she can't copy something across twice. Um, but uh, I think the five that you mentioned, I mean, I, I wish I could add to it and suggest some alternative names, but they do seem to be the most likely names that we've got here. Um, uh, Dominic Vaughan question uh, back again about Song of Ice and Fire saying, do Ned's Stark generation have magical abilities? Um, well, this is a good question. So his generation being him, Brandon, Leanna, and Benjamin. I, I think the the clear hint is that they do have some kind of um, links across, uh, but it's not as strong as Ned's children. All of them appear to have very strong links, particularly to their direwolves. Perhaps it's because those that group of Starks they they weren't. They didn't have direwolves and they weren't brought up uh, to be as northern as their predecessors were, uh, in all honesty. Um, Ned, we think of as being this ultimate northerner. Actually, he was brought up in the Vale. So, yes, he understands the northerners, but he also understands the southerners. Um, uh, ditto Brandon. He was he was fostered, yes, in the north, but right to the south of the north. Uh, so um, I think that and with sort of the where knightly culture and, and horse riding and all the rest of it was very strong. Um, uh, Andrew Kay is asking uh, on Westworld whether Wyatt is possibly in one of the pearls, might need some ruthless muscle behind it. I think Wyatt and Dolores now have been fully merged, and I think that we are seeing the Dolores that we see is this fully merged version of, of Wyatt and herself. It's definitely not just Dolores, the, the, the uh, the farmer's daughter, uh, the the rancher's daughter. That that's that's not it. It is the version that we saw in season two, which had Wyatt sort of grafted into it. Um, uh, Robinson eighty eight says, "How do you think we'll see William return in season three? He appears to be living in the future. Could other characters be in his timeline?" Um, I I think uh, that. But he may be in the future. We haven't yet seen him, so we don't know yet. But I think that what we'll see is that he is in the aftermath of this huge decline for him. He went on this downward spiral uh, at the end of season two that he was, uh, we discovered that his wife found out who he really was and committed suicide. He accidentally killed his own daughter uh, he got to the point of nearly committing suicide, of doubting whether he was even human. He is going to be in an incredibly dark place at the end of it all. And everything that he built up, Delos, his family, everything just crashing down around his ears. So that, I think, is going to be the starting point for him in season three. And the hints we've had from the trailers 
where he's there in a bath that looks like the bath that his wife committed suicide in. Um, and uh, when he's shooting a mirror, he looks at it and he sees himself, he's shooting the mirror. That Those things all scream of him reaching rock bottom and hating who he is and what he has done. And then we will see a slow build up from that. So that seems to be where it's at. Yes, it may be in the future, but we at some point we need to see that little uh, bit of story of bringing him from where we last saw him uh, up to where he's going to end up. Um, uh, Tinker Bell saying, I don't think Dolores brought Clementine. Clementine is Team Maeve, not Team Dolores. Yeah, I, th I think that's a fair point. Um, uh, I think the other people are, are almost nailed on certainties, it has to be said. Um, Donald Peoples, you asked a super chat ages ago that I said I would cover when we get to talk about Westworld, saying your thoughts on William the Man in Black this season. Uh, I feel like I derailed the discussion on him on Sunday stream. Um, I don't think you did. I think we're having a good, good discussion about that. Um, I think I've covered that already uh, just a moment ago, but that's my, my general thoughts as I say on him are, I think we're going to be picking up on him. He still will be a an influential person within Delos. And um, I think that he's, we're also going to learn partly through him what the link is between Delos and Insight. And I think that's probably why Dolores is going to go and see him. Um, but uh, as for where he goes in this, um, I my my take is still until we see something else that he is going to uh, end up in some kind of um, um, men mental health hospital or something along those lines, something that can sort of uh, help him. He may even uh, put himself uh, down um, into there just because he realizes who, who he is. He's trying to um, trying to harm himself as it were, or, prote or protect himself from himself. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying, have you ever done a deep dive about Nave's, uh, Maeve's name? Uh, no, I haven't yet. I have to say it would be quite an interesting little um, uh, route to go down. Um, just having a quick flick through just to see... Um, any more questions or comments to pick up? Uh, 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 Robinson 88, yes, the post credit scene of the final episode of season two is in the future. Um, I don't think that we're going to immediately be building on that. I think we're building towards that. That was more, uh, although this was you know, very much seen as kind of a teaser, that was more, I think, of uh, showing the end to the arc that he went in season two that there will be some point where um uh, his daughter even in a different alternate way she does give him this fate worse than death always having to go through uh, the same test that he put on to james delos that would be he would hate that um so even if this is um uh, a host version of her and a host version of him that is for him hell so i think that is why they include that just to round off that kind of uh, character arc that that is where he's going to end up um okay i think um andrew k is saying may uh, believe translates to she who intoxicates and was a warrior queen in Irish law and legend. Well, that certainly makes a huge amount of sense. Okay, guys, I've been going on for about two hours now. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start wrapping this one up. If you do have any final questions, uh, quickly drop them in there before uh, before I... Oh, Donald Peoples, thank you so much. She's saying, comment above, um, uh, saying, I've seen it said that this season feels different. I think that's because the first season was structured from Dolores' point of view, rerunning the maze. The second from Bernard, putting together his fractured memory. And the third from Caleb, Caleb's straightforward human perspective. I think that's a that's a really good point, actually. So, 
season two did feel disjointed deliberately because we were being shown Bernard's disjointed memories because he scrambled his his mind and his memories. And so we were seeing the scrambled memories, which makes for uh, confusing TV. But when you watch it back, and I would recommend if you did find it confusing at the time, when you watch it back, knowing the end point that uh, those bits of Bernard that we see there, uh, when he's looking confused, um, that is his scrambled results of his scrambled memory. That uh, it does make for a really, really good um, uh, sort of narrative that runs through that season. So I think for me, it, it improves on second viewing um, that season. The, seeing season one through Dolores' eyes, I think is a fascinating uh, idea. Yes, we do. We um, uh, What happened in season um, two, incidentally, is that we had a couple of episodes where they broke out and we saw things predominantly from random other characters like Ketchita. Um, uh, and uh, there was also the one where we saw a lot more from William, from the Man in Black's perspective, when he went back into his history and all the rest of it. So those are the, um, uh, the, the moments that that took us out into a slightly different uh, narrative style, and those are the episodes that, on their own, when they do stand alone, a fantastic episode, both of them stand alone worked really well. Um, uh, so this season is it, it is it going to be shown predominantly from Caleb's perspective? Um, some of the story will be certainly that bit there, but as with all of Westworld, it's it's we're going to see lots of different bits. We're going to see. Bernard's story, we're going to see Maeve's story, we're going to see Caleb's perspective, which is the new bit, uh, and we are going to see Dolores um, as, as well, not just through Caleb's perspective. But I, I really like that the, the logic there. I think that as a sort of an overview, that that does make sense. And yes, yeah, so seeing it out in the real world is it is a it is a change of feel, and it is a. Uh, it, it feels as if they're not trying to play games with us, they're just trying to show us the story, which is uh, fantastic. Mark Kina saying, uh, no question, I watch all your videos. First time I caught you live, so wanted to show support and just keep coming out with the great content and insights. Thank you so much and welcome if this is your first time watching live. Uh, I love it when people uh, get a chance to do this uh, for the first time. Uh, and Maura Lee, thank you again, Maura, that's incredibly generous, saying, I think on the latest trailer, we see Maeve in War World. Where do you see her character arc going as the season moves forward? Will she eventually leave the park? And if so, what will she be doing? Yeah, so the we've, we've seen in various trailers, uh, she does, well, in fact, even at the end of episode one, uh, you may have missed it, but if you watch to the end of the credits, then you get, about 30 seconds of Maeve in War World, uh, and she basically, she wakes up, looks a bit confused, realises that she's just been tied up and punched a Nazi, it would appear, um, and then she opens the shutters and, and sees where she is, which looks to be um, uh, wartime, Second World War, occupied Europe. So that's the uh, that's all we got from that. Uh, episode two, yes, we will see her move on beyond from that and out at some point. For First of all, Bernard is trying to find her, but then at some point um, she will indeed come out into the outside world. And uh, Sarak, the, uh, the head honcho person of Insight, um, appears to ask her then to track down Dolores. Uh, and kill her, presumably. Now, the big question for me with Maeve is what her uh, motivation is going to be this season. Because season one, she her motivation was figuring out what was going on and then getting out the park. That was It was very clear what her motivation was. Season two, her motivation was to find her daughter and then uh, get her daughter to safety. Again, very clear what her motivation is. She's done that now, so what is she going to do next? She's 
Uh, she's going to wake up again. Looks like she reasonably quickly rediscovers all her abilities. Um, I, I, she then has to figure out what what she wants to do. I think that the only other bit of information we have at the moment is that she has always been very strong through this on people having free will, being able to make their own choices. So it may be that she tries to free up a few more of the uh, the hosts um, within the park first. Um, uh, and the question is why she might want to go after Dolores if it looks like Dolores is actually in going to be in the business of controlling people, um, then maybe Maeve will be against that. But I think we will find out. This is I can't wait to have a proper uh, chance to interact with Maeve in hopefully episode two so that we understand what her motivation is. And once we do that, I think we've got a much better idea about where, uh, where she's going to be going in this season. Uh, okay, I think uh, I think that now is um, uh, OTDA saying, yeah, she's going to go ballistic next episode. I bet trying to leave that part of the park. Well, it certainly makes sense. The trailer seems to suggest that she then goes and finds Hector. Um, the other thing I would throw into the mix is that it, it, you kind of like dismiss it when you go through uh, season two because it was right in the middle of a whole load of other really exciting things happening. but she was really taken by when Lee Sizemore sacrificed himself for her because that's what he did. He he bought her some time so she could go off and save her child. And so that, I think, showed her that humans can care. Um, she started out uh, being quite disparaging about humans, you know, when when... Felix was being nice. It was like you make a terrible human. Um, uh, because as with Dolores, the only humans that she's ever seen are the 1% who go into Westworld or the people who work for Delos. So uh, she, I think, has been changed by seeing that actually humans can grow, can change, can be self-sacrificial and can care. And that, I think, will have quite an impact on her um, going into the season because they didn't have to do that scene. Uh, it's Lee Sizemore. Um, I mean, he could very easily have not, uh, but they included it and they lingered on her face and her reaction to him doing that. Um, okay, so I'm going to... Um, <laughs> Caleb is going to go all yeah science. Uh, it's programmed deep inside inside of him. I would I would love that if he did. Um, okay, so Westworld. Um, as I say, I will uh, I will be getting into this. I'm doing uh, weekly Westworld uh, focused uh, live streams. I will pick up on some questions here on Thursday, uh, particularly questions from my patrons. Um, but on uh, Sundays at uh, five p.m. EST, that's currently 9 p.m. UK time, although the clocks will change, I think, in a week or two's time. Uh, so it'll be 10 p.m. soon. But 5 p.m. EST, um, uh, all through the season, uh, I am doing Westworld live streams just to focus in on these questions about Westworld. And I've got guests coming on uh, every week this time. Uh, again, I've got Hacks Dogma, who was fantastic. Uh, I've got a few other excellent guests lined up for future weeks as well. Um, so, guys, uh, thank you for this. I've really enjoyed this. It's been a fantastic chat. If you are uh, watching this later, then somewhere um, round about, hang on, I'll always get this one right, here-ish, uh, there will be a link to other live streams uh, that I've done. Somewhere up around here-ish will be a link to my Patreon page if you'd like to either support the channel or get access to some stuff I do just for my patrons. Uh, so guys, thank you so much for this. Um, uh, as the great Douglas Adams sort of said, don't panic today, just wash your hands lots. Take care everyone and I'll see you on Sunday.